want to welcome everyone this evening to uh, our storytelling session uh, for this Land of Beginnings Festival. I'd like to uh, first start off by thanking the um, Roanoke Island Historical Association, and, uh, which produces the Lost Colony. These, uh, this Land of Beginnings Festival was conceived by Carl Knut, the executive producer. And uh, this is the third year of the Land of Beginnings and the second year that we've had storytelling sessions. These storytelling sessions have been uh, very popular um, for one reason, because uh, the county has recorded them. And I'd like to uh, thank Dorothy Tulin from the Dare County Public Information Office and Chris Balcom, who's here tonight, uh, to do the taping. Um, these events have been uh, very popular with people who have viewed them uh, in their living room, and we hope that uh, this session will be one that people will continue to enjoy for years. I'd also like to thank our hosts, the National Park Service. It's always great to be here at the site of the first powered flight. And um, I want to welcome our panel this evening. Uh, Eddie Green, who is our living legend for this land of beginnings, is my co-host. To his right is Carl Bornfriend, Billy Brown, and Bill Harris. All of these gentlemen I'm acquainted with, but I'm hoping to get to know them better tonight. Um, we had a great storytelling uh, session last Tuesday, and uh, one of the things that we, uh, that our participants wanted to talk about was growing up as a child on the Outer Banks. And um, Bill, I'm going to start with you. Uh, you're a Kitty Hawker, and uh, you've lived here all of your life. And I, I know because we're, we're both interested in aviation that you, you have a, a love of that, but I know that there are a lot of other things that you you're, have been involved in or interested in, too. Okay, well, now, now I honestly haven't lived here all my life. I was born in Kitty Hawk. My dad was in the Coast Guard, so we lived in Florida and South Carolina for a short time. And then when, he, when World War II came on, he went overseas and my mother and brother and sister came back to Kitty Hawk. And so I lived here and finished, high, finished uh, the third grade in Kitty Hawk, and then we went to Elizabeth City. But every weekend we were back at Kitty Hawk, and all during the summers we were also in Kitty Hawk. Grade. And then I got in the uh, National Park Service and uh, moved around, and, but I always came back. I served a couple of terms here at uh, Cape Hatteras and Wright Brothers. So I have, I've, I've been kind of like Pluto, in and out in Kitty Hawk. I just, uh, I, I always knew I would come back and I couldn't wait to retire. So uh, when I retired, I came back and built a house and done, here I am, this is where I'm gonna be. So now you're in. I'm here. Good. And, and, and intend to stay. Good, and, and we're glad that you are too. Thank you. Um, well, tell us about some of the things that uh, are near and dear to you growing up here on the Outer Banks, Bill. Well, you know, I, I went, as I say, I went to school in Kitty Hawk for the first three years. And in those years, uh, the school was in the village, and it was uh, a, uh, it had high school. Uh, but in 1943, when I started school, we only had, uh, we had two grades in a classroom. So. In the first and second grade, I was in one room, and then when I went to the third grade, I moved over. And what you did then in the school was, when you went from the first grade to the second, you actually just moved over to the other side of the room. <laughs> and uh, then the same thing happened all the way through. Um, it was a great, great time, you know, growing up here. There was only about, uh, I guess, maybe 12 students in each of the classrooms, and, or in each of the grades when I was there. I remember one of the first movie, the first movie I ever saw was in the uh, auditorium at Kitty Hawk School, and it was Huckleberry Finn. It was a 16 millimeter uh, movie, and they took us into the, into the uh, auditorium, and, and they showed it, and uh, the first reel, then they had to rewind that reel and put the next one on. So, uh, so it was, you had a little interlude there between the uh, reels. But I remember that being the first movie that I ever saw as a kid. 
or first move to Arizona, period. Uh, we have, of course, had recess and, um, and uh, twice a day, and we go out and play on the concrete basketball court. Kitty Hawk was never fortunate enough to have a gym, so for many, many years before I was in school, they just played on the sand. And a lot of people didn't like to come and play Kitty Hawk in, at school because they couldn't bounce the ball in the sand. Of course, the kids in Kitty Hawk knew how to get around that, and so they would win a few games at Kitty Hawk, but not anywhere else. <laughs> and, uh, but when, by the time I got in school, and I think it was about 1943, that uh, they actually paved a concrete pad for the, uh, for the basketball court. They actually had two courts. The girls played on one, the boys played on the other. But it was a lot of fun going up here, and uh, we would run through the woods, uh, walk on the beach, uh, play in, in the bay, in Kitty Hawk Bay, fish off the old docks that were around. So it was, it was just a lot of fun being here. Well, Billy, you're another one who grew up here on the Outer Banks. Yes. And, um, you know, I, I met you when you and I taught at Manio High School. Right. And in those days, uh, this was still, um, you know, this was early 70s, but it was still very much a rural environment during that time. And teaching school was something that people did in the off season. Not to disparage, not to disparage your uh, professional integrity, but you know, this teaching school was really something that that people could do in the winter time. It, it was a nine months a year job. Right, but you I had to have I, something to do the other three months. But I also remember that uh, many afternoons uh, you were out in a skiff and you were fishing, and um, you know, you you were as occupied away from school as you were there. But one of the things that I do remember passing by your classroom, seeing you sitting on your desk, and uh, teaching uh, your class from David Stick's uh, A Brief History of Dare County. Yes. Yes, we used it as a textbook. Dare County of History. It was about that. And, and I had to do this for eight weeks, and you could read that book in one day with no trouble at all. <laughs> <laughs> But but we, we we added we added to it and we, you know well well tell us about some of the things that you added to it. <laughs> well, he would mention a topic and then we would have to go in and do some research on it. And one thing we did do in that class, which I'm I'm almost ashamed to tell you, is I got the kids to go home and interview their grandparents. These are older people, a lot of them 70, 80 years old, and uh, <laughs> that. They brought these tapes in for a grade. I especially encourage kids that were not doing very good in class to go interview somebody so we can help you out a little bit. And uh, I had a collection of about 30 tapes. I mean, people like Waylon Baum and old man Willie Etheridge. And they're talking about uh, going up in Broad Creek in the wintertime and chipping ice and putting it in a ice house in the ground made out of sawdust and uh, holding it for the shad season in the spring and talking about the, the pound nets and that used to be king around here, the shad. They're talking about all these interesting things that, uh, and these people are going, but somebody took the tapes. I left them in the library with 30 tapes, cassette tapes, and somebody took them. And there were people from Man's Harbor, people from Wanchies. Kids came, at that time we were consolidated, everybody went to Manio, so I got them all. And and that was a, a real loss. Well, you know, one of the things that we're hoping to do through these storytelling events is to preserve some of that history that has right. been lost. And, right. and one of the things that I continue to do is to encourage not only the people who are here in the audience, but people who will be viewing this uh, tape in their living room at, at home to, you know, come forward. And the Outer Banks History Center uh, one of our good partners in the community is uh, really a, a good place to call to let people know of oral histories. That's uh, one of the parts of their mission is to record that I, history, and they're interested in that. I'll give you a good example. On one of the tapes, a kid brought a tape in, and his uncle had been a bootlegger during Prohibition over in East Lake, and he never got caught. And he brought it in, he brought this tape in which explained exactly how they made it, 
lot they made. He said they made rye whiskey and something called monkey rum, <laughs> whatever that is. And that uh, the reason they didn't get caught was uh, apparently they were paying the revenuers. I, I'm not positive about that. But the point is that, uh, and he had aerial photographs and everything. And uh, I personally, when I was 10 years old, went to one of the steels. The revenuers had destroyed it. And I could still go to it today. I took a guy to it. I hadn't been there in 20 years and took somebody to it not too long ago. There's not much left, love, a little bit of rusty barrels and stuff. But that was a big industry. And we had tapes on that. We had tapes on everything. It, it was amazing. And uh, they're gone. Well, you know, those busts of Wilbur and Orville disappeared for a period of time and then reappeared after a while. So maybe we'll be lucky, <laughs> lucky enough that those tapes will resurface too. Right. Yeah, that, they were, there were some interesting tapes that I've, uh, it, it didn't seem like back then that people sh were quite as interested in history as they are now. It seemed like we're really interested in, maybe I reached the age where I'm interested in uh, learning about my ancestors, my people. I, when I was 10 years old, I could care less. You know? Well, I, I think that's one of the things that we see through history is that, you know, the common things that happen from day to day that we take for granted are things that we tend not to record or have been in the past particularly. And this day and age, I don't ne know that that's necessarily true. Sometimes we see too much. I, I want to tell you, I was listening to Bill talk about growing up here, and, and I chuckled when he talked about two classes in one room. That, he's right. They usually taught the upper class and up, drug the other ones along. <laughs> but uh, you were in the seventh grade, you were doing eighth grade math. I can tell you that. Teachers didn't have but so many hours in a day. But, uh, and, and it wasn't all bad. But the classes were small. When I graduated, it was 39 kids in the class. But uh, it, it's it, the one thing I can remember that seems not to be there today. There's two, two or three things. One of them is freedom. We had an awful lot of freedom. We ran barefooted, and this is no joke. Even to school, we went barefooted in the warm months. And the north end of Roanoke Island had very few houses. And we camped out. We rode our bikes. I believe you could lay down on the road and take a nap. No, <laughs> now, now it's entirely different. <laughs> and uh, but this was a, a, a lot. The place was a lot different back then. And um, today it seems like. Oh, and we had to learn. And he'll tell you this. We had to invent our own fun. You got up in the morning. You went out. You had to find something to do to occupy your time all day. And your parents were working. They didn't have time. Now you don't have to invent fun. The county's got you going to uh, play ball and all kind of organized activities. And I guess it has to be that way with this many people. But it's, it's really changed in that regard. Well, speaking of changes, Carl, one of, the, um, one of the topics that I hope that you would share with us today is, um, you know, because... You're, you're so involved with the Frisco Native American Museum. And uh, that's such a good resource for us to learn about um, what this land was like before the Europeans came. And, uh, you know, talking about the way things used to be, um, I'd just kind of like for, for you to, to give us your take on what you feel like the Outer Banks were like back in the 16th century. Did you want the truth or a lie? <laughs> I, want you to, I want you to tell me the truth. I have the unique distinction of being able to discuss and talk about something that I never experienced. And uh, no one else in here has either. Well, that's good. But, so, you, know, you, uh, you, have a, you have a knowledge that you need to share with us, and that's what well, I want you to do. I was sitting in my little office the uh, day before yesterday, and just in that little room, I counted 250 books which means, of course, that we're using other people's info. And that's the only way you're going to make this, because obviously <clears throat> the time you've given me a time span that keeps getting pushed back to. We used to say 10,000 years when the glacial uh, action stopped, and that's when the people migrated in. And then, of course, there are people who are finding sites, being able to check material in that sites that 
are talking 30 and 40,000 years ago, mm. which is a couple minutes, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, so I really am very pleased at the opportunity to be able to discuss that kind of stuff because I know no one could tell me no. <laughs> brought uh, this. Isn't that pretty? I wonder who the first person was who said, if I make a hole in there and wet my front lip like that, hold it over here. <laughs> Play a song. Can you play something on that? <laughs> best I can do is those. <laughs> best I can do is those long blasts. But it's interesting to think that the minds of our forebears were so sharp they could figure if they cut that end off and blew in there, they could make a sound that really does travel quite a, with a ways. So we're dealing with material and items that people handled and made things from, and it really is a splendid experience to be able to take a thing and say, now I see that was worked on by a person, what did they use it for? <clears throat> when we uh, moved to our area down in Frisco, a little bit of heaven, we heard stories, and I had to go to uh, Hatteras for some reason on the beach, and saw the whole beach at the breaking wave line was huge cedar stumps. Do you remember those? Big, thick root systems. And all these stumps were in a straight line. The water was lapping up on the stumps. And I asked a guy who really, if you don't know him, get to meet him. Shark Shoal Shanties, Don Austin. <coughs> he is uh, Mr. Dare County, in my opinion. He really does know his history and his stuff. He lived down there, and I said, uh, were those stumps put in by the, by the Corps of Engineers? Because they were in a nice straight row. He said, no, that was the original forest. He said, it came to pass later on uh, in discussing the woods that the original forests were from the ocean to the sound. Now, that's rather amazing to imagine that. Could you, uh, well, we didn't have them in the way too long, did we? We sort of wiped them out pretty fast. But grandparents told us that uh, they could stay in the trees and pull a tarzan, never even know that it was raining if they were walking on the trails. Mm -hmm. The woods were that thick. So that's pretty nice. We're uh, trying now at the museum to grow up a couple acres of woods, and it's pretty tough because the wind blows them and the bugs get them. And we feed them and prune them, but to have those wonderful forests and not have them now is just a bit sad, to say the least. So the cedar trees were right to the edge of the ocean, and it was lapping the shores. Our people here are, were woodland natives. <clears throat> they lived in a very unique fashion, because they lived in a uh, building called the Longhouse, where they could have 30 people in the house, several different families. They were uh, maybe 50, 60 feet long, they had fire holes in the top. They were made of saplings that were bent over and tied in the middle. And then, of course, they covered it with bark and woven reeds or bamboo to be mats that could be opened and closed depending on what season. And they lived there. The first bench that they put in was their beds. And the second bench was for storage of their goods. And they lived like that in a happy fashion with the plants of the island. I know all of you know the story of yucca, but just for fun, I'll tell you again. Yucca, of course, when we have groups in there, I say, don't touch that, because you're going to get a burning, bloody hole. You always get stabbed by that stuff. And so they learned that lesson pretty fast. Now we sit down, I said, now you see that particular plant? How could you turn that into some advantage? The Native Americans, someone somewhere, the first person said, if I take the leaves and strip them down into thin strips and uh, 
maybe even dye them in vegetal dyes, and then make what? Help. Baskets. Make baskets. So yucca baskets are fantastic. Then, of course, they have beautiful white flowers, followed by a purple, looks like a bean pod, but big. It has little tiny, you know, when you eat watermelon, it has the black and white seeds, those seeds that you chew and swell. Loaded with those seeds, so they took the seeds out, dried them, and ground them into a mash and a gruel. They used it like a flour. Then also the mush from that fruit was purple, so they used that as a dye. They also took that straight stem, you've seen the straight flower stem that's dry, and used it for starting fires. They also, very important, you know you can't make a hole in leather. You have to have something sharp and pointy to do that. They used the point of the yucca for needles, which was very important if you want to wear some clothes. <clears throat> right, but the way to use that is to strip the point and to pull the filament with it so that you've got the needle and the thread together. Or get an animal somewhere and tear up the muscle fiber for sinew. Are you, you going to jump in on my act? No, I'm just, no, I'm just, I'm just um, the other, interjecting a little bit. Okay, I don't mind. The other uh, use for the yucca, which is an amazing use, is that the root, big fat, pulpy root, you mush that and crush that and mix it in water, was a soapy composition. So they used it as a soap. So there's a half a dozen uses of the thing that can make bloody, burny holes. And how would you like to have been the first Native American that opened an oyster? There was no books. No one told them, hey, eat that oyster because it's good stuff. Well, down in Frisco and, and uh, going up to Buxton, we have a shell mound, an oyster and clam and scallop shell mound that I saw it one time in all these years, and I didn't want to go back. But it was supposedly five to six feet high, with the weight of that pressing into the sand a foot, 1,200 feet long. That's four football fields. Someone must have said, big person, ugly person must have said, put your shells here, you get the point? And so they all followed, and they practiced that. What? What? Well... When you're deaf, you can see somebody going to talk to you. What do you want? <laughs> what I was going to ask you about were the what? middens. Were those, those, that, that was a different. One of the typical ways that they fixed oysters and, and other seafood was to have a small hole to build a fire. It, was that the midden? Am I mistaken? No, the midden is actually the garbage heap. So midden would have everything, turtle shells and bones and all the junk that they didn't eat, obviously. That was basically a garbage heap. When Fred Willard found his midden for the lost colony down there, it was uh, garbage. Let me ask you a question about uh, art, an Indian artifact. Uh, when I was a kid, we used to spend a lot of time walking out over the sand dunes. And I remember uh, picking up arrowheads on the top of a sand dune. Why would they be up there? Were they just lost, or...? Well, they hunted, too. You mean, why did the arrow arrive up there? They hunted up there. There was the veggies and stuff, the critters that they would hunt for. But I thought you meant the fact that you'll see them on a little pedestal. Well, what would happen is, is oftentimes, after a heavy rain or a lot of wind, right. you, you would find them just laying on the ground, on the barren sand up there. And right. I've never seen many animals on that hill, although I have seen geese up there resting. I think way before, uh, a guy once wrote when he got here that the Native Americans for thousands of years thought they were living in Eden until the white man arrived, until the European arrived. He didn't name his color. So I'm sure that there must have been some critters up there that they were able to get to and hunt. There are points that come off of that top that are war points because we have some of those. But uh, basically, I think it was probably they were hunting there. Okay. Well, you know, I've, I've moved in the past year, and I've um, not unpacked a lot of my treasures, but among those things are some, of, some points and spearheads and other tools that um, 
my, fr my father brought home to me from here that were given to him by Billy Brown's father. Were they gray stone and some color like browns and stuff? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They stone sharp sometimes? Right. Yeah. And found on the sand and ground? I'm not sure what the origin of them yeah. was. Because I lost some there. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what it turns into a funny situation? I want my property back. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I'll do, Carl, is bring them to you and let you look, see if you recognize them. Okay. <laughs> no, I well, won't. The ones I found were before you came to the Outer Banks, so I'm sure you didn't lose them. <laughs> <laughs> really, you don't know when I got here. I <laughs> when did you get okay. here? Okay, you, you got out of that one, Bill. <laughs> what? One, of, one of the things that Billy mentioned was that, that we had time to do things we had to make our own fun and, and that's really true you know uh we didn't have organized ball teams and so forth and so we spent a lot of time as kids playing along the side or playing in the woods and i remember cutting up uh, uh, some of the guys and i would would cut up a, a vine that would be attached to a limb that was hanging out and, and we'd make a swing out of that you know we'd be out there playing uh Tarzan, I guess, but uh, we just rambled around in the woods, and, and the other thing is that our parents really didn't worry about us because all the neighbors kept an eye on us as well. I know we were never out of sight of somebody, hardly, and, uh, and I think there was a lot of, a lot of uh, connection there between the families because uh, you could go anywhere you wanted to, and if you happen to get thirsty and need a drink of water, you could go into over to Mr. Marvin's or you know wherever you happen to be, and and uh, they fix you up. And but they looked after you. I think families looked after each other much more then because you knew everybody. One of the interesting things about people, we always called them like Mr. Marvin and Miss Hannah. Never called them Mr. Midget or Mrs. Midget, but we called them by their first name, and we always put a handle on it. That's something that I think we've, we've lost track of over the years. I was also interested in uh, your comment about the, the tapes that you did. When I was in college, I had to do a, a history on something. I had to do a report on something. So I tried to do it on Kitty Hawk, and I made tapes of people. I interviewed people in the 1960s. And I did it because I was lazy. And the reason I was la uh, lazy is I couldn't take notes fast enough when I talked to people, so I, I borrowed a tape recorder and recorded them. And those tapes today are at the Outer Banks History Center. Uh, so so recorded, oral history recording is really super, and I continue to do that even today. Talk to old well, people. I, I encourage these kids to, you know, go interview their next door neighbor or... Uh, maybe their grandfather or anybody. I had some tapes that were just unbelievable. The, the, the people really uh, talking about everything in the world, about the women that used to mend the nets in the net yards down at Wan Cheese. That, that wasn't a man's job, that was a woman's job. Nothing against, girls don't get upset, but that was the woman's job. That's why I think that's why they called it sewing nets instead of uh, mending net or whatever, or tying net, but anyway, uh, the women did most of that work. You can kind of judge your age by whether or not you are doing the interview or being interviewed. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Well, I'm happy that I'm doing the interviewing tonight. <laughs> uh, Billy, you've recently um, published a book, Mullet Roar and Other Stories by yeah. an Outer Banker. And uh, in that book, you've recorded uh, a lot of your memories and uh, you know we're we're glad that you, that you um, took on that task. I know it wasn't an easy job, but uh, it's a delightful read. And um, I was asked the other day if I had read the book, and I said no. I've read around it because um, it's it was interesting to learn things about you that I didn't know. But it was also obvious that as a child growing up, you had someone pointing a camera at you because there are a lot of photographs there. And um, I remember uh, your father, Acock Brown, when I first came here. And uh, he was still running around with cameras slung around his neck, trying to capture the moment. And um, I remember going in, because my father had asked me to, to go and to give him my regards, because 
Aycock was one of uh, 150 stringers that my father had across the eastern part of the state. Yeah. But he, he was more than just a correspondent because when my father would return from trips from the Outer Banks, he would have your father's book of the Wright brothers or that was autographed for me or he would have the Indian artifacts or he would have a commemorative coin from the 350th anniversary. Hey. So there were just a lot of gifts that your father gave me before I even realized uh, who he was. But, uh, you know, you, you've uh, certainly uh, inherited uh, some of his gifts and have, 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 we appreciate your being willing to pass those on. I, I wrote a story in this book about, as a boy, going by my dad's office, which was in the community building, which is across from uh, Colony Tire in Mania. And I went by the office one afternoon to see if I could get money to go to the movie that night. And that was not a real friendly thing to do. I mean, <laughs> you had to walk carefully and be careful what you said and how you approached the subject. And I finally got up the nerve to ask, could I have a quarter to go to the movie? And he said, get in the car, we'll talk about it. And I said, uh-oh. So we got in the car, and it was Christmas. I remember we pulled out in the street, and as we turned up toward Manio, the lights were strung from pole to pole, not the kind of decorations they have now, colored lights. And all the way up, there was a, there was a big, dark cloud hanging out over the ocean. And, and as we're going up the street, we, we passed by Quinn's Furniture Company, and we stopped right in front of Time's Printing Company. And I figured... Maybe he's going to run in and say something to Victor Meekins in the newspaper. He went in the back of the car and started fiddling around, and he pulled out a bottle of wine. And he wrapped that bottle of wine in some tin foil and grabbed a sticky bow and put on there. And this old man was coming down the street. It was a colored man. He was coming down the street, and he walked over, and he said, Merry Christmas, and handed him that uh, bottle of wine. And, and I didn't say a word. When he got back in the car, I said, why did you give him a bottle of wine? I said, uh, you don't know that man. He said, it makes me feel good. It's Christmas. That's what he said. <laughs> so you're right. He, he, he was um, that way. He, he liked to help people. He, the, an interesting thing about him is uh, he supported me in all my activities growing up. But he didn't take part in anything. I mean, he ne I played sports a little bit in high school. He never went to a ball game, but he would take me out to practice, put me out if it or need be. Uh, he never went duck hunting or goose hunting, and I was crazy. He'd carry me down to the flats and put me out, and I'd walk in. And uh, the same thing with fishing when the fishing time came. But uh, he was a busy man. And I'll tell you something else about him. During the war, well, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and tell you some more about him because I'm quite proud of my dad. And, and uh, my dad came from Happy Valley, which is right down at the bottom of the mountain uh, where Blowing Rock's located. And uh, he was actually born in a log cabin. This is no joke. I don't know if he walked to school in the snow or not, but he told me he did. And uh, his family, his father's name was Charlie Brown, and Charlie Brown was uh, uh, about to have a, his, my grandma was about to have a child, and uh, a man came to the house one day and knocked on the door and said, uh, uh, I'd like for you to vote. I'm going to run for governor. I want you to vote for me. And. Charlie Brown was so impressed with the fact this guy showed up at his door. He said, well, if we have a child, we'll name it after you. And, of course, Governor Acock became governor, and that's where Daddy got his name. <laughs> well, later, later, he, Char, uh, Charlie Brown was called out to Hillsboro to manage a, a farm or it's kind of a dude-type ranch. That's the way Daddy described it. It called Okanichi Farm. It was for one of the captains of industry from the state, uh, uh, 
Julian Shakespeare car, and he, he ran this farm, and, and then a tornado came down through there, and my grandmother had died, and grandfather remarried, and this, that, and another, and the family split up. And, and he ended up in Beaufort working on a small newspaper, and he went over to Ocracoke one weekend, and, and uh, he met my mom, and that was that. And then during the war, he worked in, uh, as a, uh, uh, he had a correspondent for the Navy. He, he patrolled up and down the beach, and I think he got to meet a lot of important people in the villages, and he knew who to call or who to get in touch with if he wanted to find something out. So, and, and, and it just, it, it, it worked real well with his job later and later on. But uh, well, he, he, he was he was unique in that. He was a workaholic too. He he got up every morning, printed uh, pictures. He'd get up at four o'clock. He'd go to bed about. And, and later in life, he 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 would go to bed maybe at eight or nine o'clock. But he used to go to bed about ten or eleven o'clock. And he'd be developing negatives at night, hanging them up. And the next morning, he'd be in a dark room printing pictures. And <laughs> not many men work like that. And let's all do. He knew a lot of people. Well, obviously that work ethic stretched to you. Just you applied it to uh, hunting, fishing, proging. I'll, I'll tell you something about me that uh, a lot of people don't know. It's when I was seven, eight, nine years old, I was in the Lost Colony. Most kids made a shot at the lost colony, took a spin, and I paid, played one of the colonist boys, and uh, the pay was seven dollars and fifty cents a week. <laughs> My dad said, "I'm going to set you up in business," and he went ordered from Sears and Roebuck a gasoline-powered lawnmower, and it was a new type. It didn't turn this way; it turned like this, and. Uh, I started mowing grass. Well, I, I, I probably mowed every yard in Mania at one time or another, and the average pay on a yard was $3, $3 and a half. And I went out and mowed my English teacher's yard one time. It took all day long from morning to late afternoon. I charged her $12, and he made me take half of it back and give it to her, said she might fail you. <laughs> <laughs> but then, anyway, I, I, then I found out that I could go fishing on a fishing boat, and I got a job when I was 10 years old. Well, you can't take a kid 10 years old to Oregon Inlet today and expect them to do a good job. People pay too much money, you know. But back then, it was, you only got $75 to go to the Gulf Stream and 45 for an inlet trip and 35 for a half a day. I got paid a dollar and a half for a half a day. But I, I was surprised because I, I, I was so crazy about fishing that, uh, uh, that people would pay me to go out there. I got $3 for all day, and I got $5 for uh, going to the Gulf Stream, and the average tip was about $0.25, $0.50, $0.75. Cent. Today it costs $1,650 to go to the <laughs> Gulf Stream, and the average tip is about $300. <laughs> so all this is changing. I mean, it is. It, these outer banks, I'm, and this is something that I, I see these comments made from time to time. And uh, um, if you move to the outer banks in the last 10 years, you don't remember the things I remember how it used to be. But that does, that's not bad because people that move here in the last 10 years still see the beauty. They still see the attractions. And they don't know anything about the, what used to be, you know before they built the road to Oregon Island, driving down the beach or driving through that marsh, <laughs> crossing those dikes. That, that, that was quite an uh, that that was quite an experience, you know. And uh, the this place is changing, it's changing very rapidly, but it's it's still a wonderful place. I chose to live here all my life and uh, I know others have too. Well, I, th I think all of us would ag agree with you. And, you know, Eddie, I know that you're one who came here and fell in love with the place. And um, 
you know, you've certainly made an impact on the lives of people who have visited here and, um, and those who live here, too. You've been very active in the community. And um, you know, this, this week we're honoring you for that service, and, and we applaud you for what you've, for what you've done. Now, you, you talked to me about um, your, your being active. Billy's talked about Roanoke Island. You, you talked to me about uh, your involvement with the town and the revitali revitalization of that waterfront. And that's been within uh, the past 25 years, but that certainly that's has right. made a difference yeah. to those people who are coming here today, too. You know, when I, I first arrived on the island, it was 1953. And if I figure right, you were kids. From what you're telling me, but I mean, I was you, 13. In 1953? It's easy to remember my age. I was born in 40. Okay. <laughs> because when I came down, I'd been hired uh, to come down in the Lost Colony, and I was in New York City. And what was told to me about the Outer Banks by John Lehman, the choreographer of the Lost Colony, uh, was just quite incredible. He described the people, the customs, the environment, the history of the Lost Colony Theater. Everything he told me was, and I mentioned this the other day, was exactly, he didn't exaggerate. The people were wonderful. And, and it was that simplicity that existed here. Take me out of Manhattan. And I, I looked back and I said, I used to tell people that there were probably more people lived on the block that I lived in in Manhattan at that time than lived in all of Dare County. Yeah. And there was that simplicity. And I was fascinated because we arrived on Memorial Day weekend. We drove all night, came down uh, the coast of the United States on US 13, which was one lane in each direction, took the ferry boat across at Kiptapiki Beach over to uh, Little Creek. Yeah, that, that's right, because the, uh, the ferry used to come in right next to where the Little Creek uh, uh, amphibious base was, because I was stationed there during the war. and. Uh, then we took, a, what was it, 168 all the way down to 158, and we arrived at about 8 o'clock in the morning at the top of the beach, came across the old wooden bridge, and uh, I had three other dancers in the car with me. And we, we hit at the top of the beach and made that right angle turn to go down at, at the pier. And we all agreed that we, think we had been scammed because we were told that we were going to perform for about 15 to 1,800 people a night. And there was so little on the beach, I mean, as far as structures, buildings. And we rode all the way down and never passed a car. This was 8 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday morning and drove into Matteo and parked right in front of the community building, which your father had an office in. And... Uh, I think ours was only one of two cars that were on the whole street, all the way downtown. And then we start checked in at the wigwam, and the first thing I learned about was that the wigwam was owned by Aunt Mary and Uncle Bob O'Neill. You see, we were told, we didn't call them Miss Mary or Mr. O or Mr. Bob, but we were told Aunt Mary. And that's what I, that grabbed me right away. I thought, what a wonderful way. And the people were friendly. We'd walk down the street. And of course, John Lehman said everybody went barefoot. So the first thing we did was kick off our shoes. And we never did wear them again until uh, we had to leave right after Labor Day weekend to go back north. I had my first hush puppies and fearings. And in those days, that was the only place that had air conditioning. And uh, we got to know that the, uh, a lot of the singers lived in Aunt Grace Davis's house across the street. And that was quite something, because she had a television. And that was the only television we knew of on the street. And all you saw was snow, but you could hear voices coming over with it, and you could see shadows. But we, we sat and watched that. But there was something about the Outer Banks and the, the tradition, and the school bus would pick up all the kids and all the people. Not everybody had cars in those days. And I had a car. It was a 39 Plymouth. And uh, so we had a carpool, the dancers that came down from New York with me and they pitched in to help pay for the gas. Our pay as, as full-time performers wasn't that great. We were getting $35 a week. <laughs> and, uh, but it was like magic. And I really, I went back to the city and I had uh, separation pangs leaving the community and going back north. So I came back in 54. 
And then after that, something, a little voice said, you can't go back there again. You need to stay and study a little bit more. And that's when I got into equity and toured with Broadway shows. But that sealed my doom. I couldn't come back on a regular basis because the Lost Colony Theater production was not unionized. And uh, so I would always come back and visit any time I could. And over the years, I got to know so many people that it just made sense to me that if ever I was going to come back, I mean, uh, retire from theater, this is where I would want to settle. And I used to walk around Manteo, the waterfront, there was no park there. And I didn't dream about a park, but there was a charm about what buildings were left. And I'd say, why don't they do something about this? They don't know what they've got. And so when I, I did move down here, I got involved in, in uh, uh, a little bit of zoning. And I didn't know anything about anything, truthfully. And uh, I mentioned the other day that I, I got hooked into the Chamber of Commerce, and I didn't know what a Chamber of Commerce was, what its purpose was, or what Robert's rules, uh, parliamentary rules were. And that was the same thing when I uh, was appointed to the town board. But uh, gradually, I fell into all that stuff. And I've never regretted a moment. This has been an incredible journey uh, to have come here and lived here for 40 years and get to know so many people and watch them growing up, growing older. And I'm growing older right along with them. But uh, I, I can't imagine ever living in a city. But I disagree with you. The, well, may, maybe people still think this area is beautiful, and it is. A little lately, there's been a few things constructed I'm not thrilled with, but, uh, but I consider myself blessed and fortunate that I discovered the area in 1953 and got to know the people and got a sense of community. And that is what makes the Outer Banks different than so many other places. I think the same problems and same changes are occurring everywhere else. But I don't care about everywhere else. It's here in the Outer Banks that I care. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, that's it. Well, you know, Eddie, I arrived 20 years later. I was two years old when you came to the Outer Banks. But when I had a chance uh, to move here, I found much the same thing. And um, I would like to think that those people who come today um, can find that as well. I know that, uh, Carl, you have a lot of contact with, That's with visitors. That's what I was getting at. We, mm -hmm. we, in 1950, things were much different, and we remember that. But the people that moved in last year remember what's going on right now, and they were still attracted. There's a magnetic attraction mm -hmm. that pulls you here. That's what I was getting at. It's still a wonderful place. Can I give the other half of my presentation? <laughs> <laughs> There was one uh, astounding fact that came across our uh, interest and concerns down there at the museum, the Inquisition, which inspired that famous Italian to come here and cause so much problem. The Inquisition uh, chased a lot of folks from Spain and Portugal and France all the way around the Mediterranean. And believe it or not, they settled in our country. They were dark-skinned Europeans. They obviously were losers because they were dark-skinned, unfortunately for them. They were people of means. They had farms, they had bank accounts, whatever they had to survive, and they did very nicely, except that they were abused. They lost their land, and they lost their rights to exist. They married into the tribes, into the native tribes, which had already taken in the blacks. So you have that genetic pool where the black genes prevailed. These people married in, too. A guy named, and I can't tell you where it was, uh, in Virginia, I think, uh, at a university, named N. Brandt Kennedy, an Irishman, saw that his neighbors and his family, people that he knew and strangers, had dark skin. They were European. They were features that looked like things that he was familiar with. He started to study their uh, family trees and their uh, genetics and where they were from and 
lo and behold, he connected it all back to around the Mediterranean and that route that I described to you. And those folks married in also. And there's a French word, any of you that are French aware, called melangian. You know what that is? Melange. I'm deaf, so I didn't hear anyone respond. It's a mixture. Melange is a mixture. <clears throat> and so when they got disenfranchised and kicked out of here and there and everywhere, they ended up in Appalachia. Kennedy decided he wanted to study those folks. He even got so far as doing DNA. He went back to the Mediterranean and started visiting towns and cities and villages and trying to see, he saw exactly those people that he was relatives of and his neighbors in the Appalachian area. He said the faces were the same, but they spoke a different language. I can't recall what he taught, but it must have been some awareness of language because guess what? He discovered, you know, our people here are not Algonquian, they spoke Algonquian language. They were called Hatterask. Croatoans. He discovered that there were several hundred words over there that were used by our people here. And one word that I wanted to share with you was what do we call those folks? Hatterask or Croatoans? What country could he have visited over there? Croatia. He said they were saying, using words that our Algonquian people use. How's that for a connection? I thought you'd enjoy that little tale. And when you want the truth, stop down the museum. <laughs> <laughs> no, that is the truth. Well, you know, I, I'm aware that Europeans were sailing by here in the early 16th century. I think Verrazano, or my understanding, he would call himself Verrazano, came here 1523, 1524. And when they looked at the Outer Banks from the tops of those ships, they, he declared that it was the great Pacific Ocean on the other side, that the Pamlico yeah. Sound was the Pacific. And uh, when he took that information back to um, the map makers, they created a map that shows an isthmus between the continent of North America and the Outer Banks of, of yeah. North Carolina that we know now as the Outer Banks connected to uh, what was then known as Florida. And that map existed for a number of years until um, these expeditions uh, mapped the inner inland and the other areas of the coast. That was N. Brant Kennedy, if you want to read his book on the Melungeon. <coughs> well, you know, I've heard of that Croatian connection, and it's not surprising to me that, um, that there would have been Europeans. You know, they were sailing to the Grand Banks and fishing off of the Grand Banks for uh, generations before they sailed this far south. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's not out of the question that there was uh, early contact prior to that that we know of the recorded history. We were in West Virginia last week, and I was looking all over the place for those people, but unfortunately didn't see anyone that was reminiscent of that type. We get an amazing Cherokee. How many people in here know that they have Native American heritage? You do. We get people in who tell us they're Native American. They are blonde hair, blue eyes, skin like snow. And I say, what Irishmen got in the past? How'd you know that? <laughs> <laughs> because the genes prevail. And so you can't look at someone and know who they are. That's a fact. Did you know my wife's great-grandmother was named Pocahontas? She's, we determined, is part Pamunkey, after the famous river of that name. Hi, babe. <laughs> well, I don't want to interrupt you, Carl. No, that's all right. I'm sleeping anyhow. Okay. <laughs> um, Bill Harris, I want, I know that you and I um, met each other as we prepared for the uh, anniversary of flight in 2003. And um, I know that um, 
history in general is uh, a love of yours, but I know that you have a passion for this very spot and what happened here. You want to tell us a little bit about what that means to you? Well, one of the things that, um, you know, I can, I can draw a, a contact with the Wright brothers because my grandfather met Wilbur when he came ashore. Now, he never saw the flights. He saw, and, and people in Kitty Hawk saw the Wright brothers because they were constantly coming to the post office or coming through the village. So, so I have that kind of connection. When, when I was doing the interviews back in 1960, uh, I talked with a lady named Mary Midget. Her husband was Franklin Harris Midget, and the Wright brothers came down on his ferry boat, his freight boat, and sometimes they spent the night with her or with them, and then on, uh, and before they went to the camp building, and then sometimes on the way back going to Dayton, they spent the night before they left the next morning on the freight boat. So the people in Kitty Hawk have, uh, uh, you know, have a very strong attachment to the Wright brothers, although not many of them really knew them that well because they were a little bit, you know, distant. Um, and so, so with my grandfather's connection, um, you know, you, you have that same kind of feeling. I, I remember I asked my grandfather one time, says, well, where was their camp when they came here in 1900? So I was old enough to drive then, so he pointed it out to me. I wish I could find the site today. There's a subdivision in that location, but at least he pointed it out. I also asked him, well, where did they come ashore? And I went to, down to uh, where David Stick lives uh, at the head of Kitty Hawk Bay, and he pointed out where the Wright brothers you know, came, to, when, where Wilbur came the first time. So, so that's a connection that not a lot of people have that opportunity to have. When I was going to school, on December 17th, they always took the kids from uh, the school and brought them down. They didn't bring them down here in 1943 because they, there was a blizzard in December and there was no program. Uh, they, it was one of the few times there was not a December 17th program. But in 44 and 45, they, uh, uh, we came down here. I saw a picture the other day of, of a little girl who put the... the um, uh, wreath on, uh, at the monument, and it was Lois Pierce. Uh, I was there that day, but I didn't pay any attention because one of the things we did as kids was get a we get a piece of cardboard and we'd slide down the steep slope of the hill. So I don't know what happened there. I, I was I had a lot of fun that day. I, I slid down the steep slope of the hill. A little later on, when I had a bicycle, some of the boys in Kitty Hawk and I would ride down here, and uh, we could push our bike up to the top of the hill, and you could come down and make it three quarters of the way around just by coasting. We could get two trips in before Horace Doe would come out of his building and chase us down. We, we could see him coming, getting in his truck. He had a black Ford, he had, it was a car, but they'd taken the, uh, the back uh, um, lid off of the trunk and they put a little a little body in the back of it for a truck. And we'd see him come out and get in his car, and we knew he was after us. So out down the hill we'd come, and out the gate we came, and he'd stop us about just before we got to the uh, beach road. And uh, he said, boys, now you know uh, y'all aren't supposed to do that. No, so Mr. Horace, we didn't know that, but we won't do it again. <laughs> the poor man had terrible memory. <laughs> we, about a month later, we'd be in here doing the same thing, and he'd be after us again. Now, the interesting thing about that was that some years later, I joined the National Park Service, and I worked over here at the Visitor Center. And the, and I would look at, I'd be at the information desk, and I'd see kids up on the on the hill, coming down the hill. When we came down on a bicycle, the people that were coming up got out of the way. And in those days, they only mowed about that. You know, about a foot and a half off the path. And beyond that was pear pads and briars and all kinds. And they would jump off. And that was a lot of fun, watching those people jump off that path. Well, into when the I, pads. Into the pear pads. Right. So, so when I was working with the Park Service and I was over in the Vista Center, I'd see the kids up there. They had graduated from bicycles to skateboards. 
And you know, they can really take off on those skateboards and, and I, we captured a lot of skateboards. They, 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 they left them and kept right on running through the woods. We never did catch many boys, but we got a lot of skateboards in the process. <laughs> but, uh, it, you know, this is a, really a great place. And, and the thing that happened here was a, certainly a significant event. And I'm uh, happy that I've been associated with it through the years and, and, and still associated uh, with the First Flight Society. So uh, right, I do have a passion for this area, and uh, I appreciate uh, I appreciate the National Park Service. Even though I work for the Park Service, uh, I still appreciate what they do and what they stand for, and how they have over the years preserved the very heritage that you and I like in this outer banks. If it hadn't been for the Park Service, we probably look like a, another seashore resort. And I guarantee you, you wouldn't have the natural features that you have here today. You also wouldn't have uh, the lost colony. The Park Service has been, uh, uh, they've been outstanding in preserving the site so that you can have the lost colony. I don't think you can, I don't think you can have that play if it wasn't for what the Park Service has done at that site and made it available. So. Well, the lost colony, I had tucked in the archives and recesses of my, I'm suffering from uh, Newheimer, so forgive me. But the fort, when it was vacated by the colonists, was used by the natives. Archaeologically, they have come across evidence of that, so I thought I'd share that with our dear friends. That fort was still there when I was a kid, but it was just a small hill with a reed growing on it. And it was probably in the 50s they went in and dug it out. I don't remember the date. But my dad, I'd go up every night with my dad when I wasn't even in the show. He had to be there every night. And uh, I went to the Lost Colony so much I could repeat everybody's <laughs> lines and the entire show, in including the narrator. Oh, yeah. I could start at the beginning. And I bet you could, too, say everybody's lines all the way through close to it but you find that anybody's ever done the show if they do, if they have a passion there I always remember what Mary Long um, uh, was involved with the show back she'd been there many years and then her husband Bill Long had been involved with the scenery their son is William Ivy Long uh, junior William Ivy Long on Broadway is one of the hottest designers in, in uh, current American theater but, uh, and he grew up in the Lost Colony. But Mary Long, his mother, used to say, nobody comes to Roanoke Island and to the Lost Colony and remains neutral. They either love it or they hate it. And the people that hated it just would, never came back again or they cared not for it. But those of us who developed a passion have never given up on it. And we have, uh, it's like a family, the connections that, for, with people all over the country I've not had time to uh, learn to use a computer or the internet because I'm one of America's greatest uh, uh, workaholics. But uh, I have secretaries who do that. But the, uh, there is a, a, a site on the web called My Family. And once somebody's been connected with their lost, the lost colony, if that passion remains, they stay in touch with everybody now via the internet. And. Uh, uh, it's not uncommon. I mean, there's, there's a tradition, a thread that has spanned all these years. And now it's getting to the point where a few, a lot of the people that were in it are passing on. And there's, there's a, I don't know whether too many people in Matteo know it yet, but Chunk Simmons, who uh, was a decathlon winner in the U U.S. Olympics back in 1952, was in the Lost Colony for a couple of years, and he just passed on. But it's, it is, it's like a family. And you can see people who not have seen them for many, many years. But when they're back in Matteo, it's like one big family. Well, you know, it's always been my opinion that um, <clears throat> the presence of the pageant, as it was referred to in those days, is, is really something that's um, allowed people on Roanoke Island and on the Outer Banks to open up to people at an early time. You know, people in small communities, particularly isolated communities, tend to be clannish. And that's not to say that people haven't been clannish here, but those aren't the traits that 
we've talked about tonight and the traits that we remember, what we remember are people who were open and uh, receptive to people of uh, you know, different backgrounds. And, um, and I think that the colony has had something to do with that. Billy, you've got uh, a colony story. I know that you said that you weren't going to tell tonight, but I was, I, when, when Bill Harris was, was talking about um, December 17th, I recall you say, saying that December 17th took on a different meaning for you <laughs> at one period of time. December 17th was always one of the best duck hunting days of the year because all the planes that were flying over the monument would be staging down over Oregon Island and Pea Island and they'd be circling low to the ground <laughs> and, and they'd come flying up the beach and uh, even on a pretty day. But December 17th is usually associated with tough weather, cold, windy. Uh, Mr. Harris will tell you that most most of those celebrations he went to were rough. Hey, they some of them were really, really, really terribly cold. It was bad when the Wright brothers were here, too. <laughs> yep, that's absolutely right. They had ice in, in little puddles. Melvin Daniels says that there are five seasons on the Outer Banks. There's summer, fall, winter, spring, and December 17th. So, uh, and I, I tell you, I, I, you know, we used to, used to meet up on the hill at the monument and had the ceremonies up there, and I, you know, I've seen these pictures of the band going up and the majorettes and their little skimpy outfits. Yeah. And, you know, they, that must have been a terrible experience. But then, in 1960, the Vista Center over here opened up and, uh, and they were behind the, the leave side of the, uh, of the building. So you got away from some of the wind. I tell you, it's wonderful to have December 17th celebrations inside this building. I mean, we, yeah. we have come a long way and that's a... That's a, a great improvement that the National Park Service did by having this building here. I hope, it was only supposed to be here about five years. Of course, I, I've been, I was with the Park Service long enough to know that five years temporary time for the Park Service is more like 20, so I guess we'll continue to have this for a few more years. Well, I, I do remember being, uh, being in the flyover in 19, uh, no, that was 2002. So I was in the 99th flyover. I didn't make it for the 100th. That was some tough weather uh, on the 100th anniversary, too. Um, and we just did get that fly in, in that day before the fog set in, and, and everybody had to, to get back over to Manio or wherever it was that was their point of origin. That the uh, flyovers were a benefit to the hunters. I, I wondered. You were the superintendent. We oh. were the hunters. <laughs> well, it's kind of interesting that they, <laughs> Johnny Moore, they asked him if he was coming to the celebration one time. He said, No, I got to go hunting. <laughs> so I, I guess he, he figured this out about the flyover, too. Yeah. <laughs> Billy, how about. Um, telling us about some of your time on the water. I know you've, um, you started fishing with Joe Barry. Oh, man. And, uh, no, I actually started with a man from Man's Harbor named Clarence Holmes, and he had a boat called 610. There were three of them built. There was the Jerry Jr., the Ranger, and the Sicketan. And uh, according to John White's map, Sicketan is located on Pamico River near Little Washington on the opposite side of the bank. But he picked that name up, and uh, he was a commercial fisherman, a pine net fisherman, and in the summer he carried charters. And uh, people found out that they would pay money to go fishing. Actually, it started long before that, I think, the little bits and pieces of it. But uh, I started with him in 1915. We left from uh, the canal uh, where the boat ramp is at Pirate's Cove. That canal used to go all the way up to the intersection where CVS is located. And uh, when they built the four-lane highway, they, they, they filled in the canal. You're talking about the one on the south side. Right, on the south side of the highway. Well, they, uh, the, the fishing center that was there, by the way, in my lifetime, there's been three bridges. There was a wooden bridge and a cement bridge with wooden pilings, and now there's a cement bridge with cement pilings. And I don't know what will come next, but the, uh, there was a fishing center there. The 
probably belonged to a Mr. Turner at one time, but at, man, at the time I came along, it was George Dykster was in charge of it. And that's where the, there, the, there were also boats that left from Wanchies, some Mac Rays down in Wanchies, and there was like a little Wanchies fleet, and then there was this fleet from up here. And uh, I fished with Clarence one, two summers, or I was halfway through the second summer, and he had moved to Oregon Inlet. Everybody moved down to Oregon Inlet. Uh, I believe Toby Tillett built a fishing center, and everybody moved down to be closer to the ocean. It was a long ride down, and we, we, boats weren't fast in those days. And uh, so getting closer to the inlet was an advantage, and um, my dad used to have to get up in the morning and carry me down there. And to the inlet, he, he was getting tired of it. And one morning, I, I, I went down, and Clarence had left when I, I was a little bit late getting there. And I started going with Joe Barry. And Joe Barry was um, had a boat called the Phyllis Mag, and I worked with him for 11 years. But I have an interesting story about Joe Barry. I thought I was trying to figure out today what in the world I was going to say tonight. But I want to tell you this story. In 1944, we had a hurricane. Now, I, I was in Ocracoke, and um, I, I, I'll tell you about that. I'm getting rung up now. Uh, in 1944, I was four years old. I don't remember much, but I've heard my folks talk about it so much it seemed like I can remember. But I do remember a couple of things. The eye of the storm came over the village of Ocracoke, and when the eye came over, my brother, Brantley, ran out the front door and ran down the street to the fish house and he had a skiff tied and it was sitting on the sand. The tide was out. And all these shrimp boats, uh, shrimp had got to be a pretty good business after World War II and they got some ice and refrigeration and stuff. And, and the, all these small commercial boats were in Silver Lake. And when the, my brother started back toward the house, I can hear Mama hollering, run, Brantley, run. And, and, and he starts running and, of course, opened the front door to come in, and the wind caught the screen and kept it against the house and came in. Well, the water, we'd look out the window, and the water was coming up the street. And when our house was elevated off, and it came on up on the porch, and then it came down the hall. And my dad was with the Navy, and I had something that nobody else had. I had some pasteboard boxes to keep my toys in. And they were sitting in the hallway, and that, I remember the water got them wet and they started melting and it was tearing me up. It wasn't long, he said, we got to go. And, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I didn't, I didn't have any say so in that matter. Went out on the front porch and uh, uh, my brother and my mom dove off the front porch and my dad jumped off with me on his shoulders and we went to a house behind us owned by Charlie Mac Williams. And when we got there, there were eight families in that house that had made their way. And that was the, the first time, I'll never forget it. This is something I remember vivid. The women were all praying, down on their knees praying. And the men were all huddled around looking out the windows. And uh, that image stuck in my mind, remembering that. That, that was quite, a, quite an ordeal, but... Anyway, I was going to tell you about Joe Barry. Now, if I'm taking everybody's time, th this is a neat story. When Joe was at Dykster's uh, before my time in, in 1944, there was a man. Joe didn't have a charter boat. Joe had a shad boat, and uh, uh, the name of the shad boat was the Ella View. And he sold it in the Mariner's Museum for $5,000. He asked me one day, he said, I think I'm going to sell that boat. They're going to give me $5,000. I said, you reckon you ought to sell it? Belong to your dad. It's got gold pieces in it. It's, uh, you know, it was customary to put a gold piece in, or two. And you're the only one who knows where it is. Uh, he said, well, I, I'm not using that boat anymore. And uh, I think I'll get rid of it. But anyway, he did. He sold it to Mariner's Museum, got it. And I think it's downtown Manio now. It's one of those boats. But, but there was a man named Roy Thompson from up around Edenton that had a little yacht down there uh, called Hazel the Hazel. And uh, 
it broke loose in the storm and it went southeast. It went toward the lighthouse and then went up in Station Landing Bay and went all the way to the myrtle bushes. Uh, and uh, a day or so after the storm, Joe found the boat. He went down looking. He found the boat and he told Mr. Thompson, said, I found the boat. He said, you can have that boat for $500. Go get it. Well, Joe and his brother Maxie, who was another story, he was one of the chiefs in the all-black station down at uh, Pea Island, retired. Him and his brother took the Ella View and they went down to back of the beach and they dug a trench using that boat all the way to the marsh and they laid some rollers down and they pulled that boat out of the marsh and when it fell off in that trench, it set up straight and they towed it, but nobody thought they could do it. And we're not talking about 100 yards. We're talking about hundreds and hundreds of yards across there from Juan Cheese all the way over to the beach. And he pulled it up to uh, Kitty Hawk and I'm sure it was one of your acquaintances, Alan Heyman, put four foot on the stern and put a new cabin on it. And so that's the way Joe got his charter boat and it was $500. <laughs> So. I remember that 44 storm. It's the only one that I remember being in the eye. And I was in Kitty Hawk, and the eye passed over. It was, it was just calm, and you could see blue sky above it. But then in a little while, it came from the other side. Oh, man. It was a that, terrible thing. Well, it, 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 I've read a little bit about it that uh, uh, they didn't name storms back then. They kind of went by 33 was supposed to be bad, and 44 was terrible. I, and I heard that 44 was bad all the way up the coast because it stayed over land so much. But I was going to tell you something about 33 storm. My, my neighbor who's passed away now used to tell me stories about 1933 down at Hatteras. And, and, and last year, all that Katrina stuff that was going on down in New Orleans, I just couldn't believe what I was hearing and seeing on TV. And in 1933, a storm hit Hatteras and hit up here too. Tore the place up. Ruined everybody's gardens, killed their chickens, took their boats away and their nets. And there was no U.S. government handing out trailers or anything else. They just came right in and the people just reached down, grabbed their bootstraps and pulled themselves up. They, they chipped in together and they, they, they made a miraculous comeback. And... That's something you have to admire about these outer bankers. That's the kind of people they are. Most of them are jack all trades anyway. You know, do a little bit of everything. <laughs> well, you know, David sticks in, in the audience tonight, and one of the f stories that uh, I remember hearing him tell is of one of the first trips that he took down the beach with his father and seeing a truck turned upside down. <laughs> and uh, of course, they were concerned that somebody had had an accident, and they. When they, as they approached, they saw that um, the fellow driving the truck had broken an axle and he had turned it upside down to repair the axle. You, you, you got my answer. So let me tell you a story Daddy used to tell. And I don't know if this is true or not, but I think it is. In fact, I know it is. Uh, his job during the war was patrol from uh, Ocracoke to Kitty Hall. And uh, anything that washed up on the beach, uh, life raft or a lifeboat or a body or anything that washed ashore, he wrote reports for the Navy. Well, one night him and another fellow were down to Ocracoke and they got word that there was going to be some German spies might be coming ashore. And they were out on patrol and they went up into Trent Woods and, and they looked up ahead and they saw some red lights blinking. And he didn't know Morse code, but he said, somebody's giving a signal. And he got in an argument with the other guy. They had one pistol. And they got in an argument over uh, uh, who was going to walk up to the car. You go. He said, no, you go. It's your job. You're, you're the officer. So Daddy said he walked up to the car. And he holding that pistol, and he peeped around inside that car. And there was two people in there courting and one of them was tapping the brake with his foot. <laughs> Said that's as scared as he's ever been. <laughs> what, as he approached or when he looked inside? <laughs> huh? <laughs> Said that's the biggest relief he ever had in his life. He didn't know who was in that car. 
wonder how, how scared they were. I don't know that he said anything. <coughs> that was the story ended. They, they, I, I remember one time at Oakland Coat, uh, they, a, a sailor was swimming and a shark bit him half and two, and they brought him up in the back of a pickup truck. And, and I've always, you know, I've, I've, I've been a fisherman all my life, and I know that some of these surfers say they bite them on the foot or the ankle or whatever once in a while. But uh, there's been very few, a lot of people swim around here. There's been very few people ever really attacked. But that, that actually happened down there. I saw the guy <laughs> before yeah. they could get me away from there. Right. There, there's some big sharks in the sounds too, aren't there? Oh, really? yeah, yeah. Sometimes, but not a whole lot. Well, just between you and I, it's, it's, I, I don't mess with any of them if I can help it, you know. No, I, that's, I don't really know. I don't feel comfortable getting in the water with sharks. <laughs> well, Sorry. I, I, I had a government job for a while, and somebody told me when you're swimming with sharks, don't splash around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Billy, um, I know that uh, you own the Irma Queen for a good number of years, and you fish with her out of Oregon Inlet. Um, how many years did you fish oh, off the Irma Queen? I don't remember. The Irma Queen was about 70 years old when I got rid of it. The Irma Queen was built in 33 at uh, Ocracoke, and the 33 storm blew it over, and the boat had a twist in it. And uh, it was built for H.T. Gaskin's father, he had a sister named Irma. That's where the name Irma Queen. And uh, it was built for drop net fishing on Diamond Shoals when the bluefish were here in the 30s. And then the bluefish went away for a while, and uh, the boat was evolved into a charter boat eventually. It was a little shrimper, a little this, a little that. And uh, most of these outer bankers were progers. They, they went from season to season doing whatever they had to do to make a living. And H.T. Uh, brought the Irma Queen up to Oregon Inlet to, because there was more charters there than there was in Hatteras. And uh, eventually he, he got another boat. It used to be one of the twins he bought from Edgar Stein. And uh, I bought the Irma Queen. I had run it a couple of years, and I didn't change the name because I was I was afraid I might lose some business. And so that's what I did. I taught school and I ran the boat in the summertime. It was a, uh, it was a very good life. Very good. I got to meet a lot of people and uh, have a lot of fun. Eventually I carried my boys with me, you know. They, they could fish with me. That, that, that was a... a a unique experience, it really was. And I was fishing, you know, hear, hear these guys that are duck hunters talk about in the old days, the, the, there were clouds of ducks. Well, they weren't like that when I was growing up, but it was still pretty good. But when I went fishing, there were clouds of fish, but not no more. That's, that's sad, really, to me. I didn't think it was possible to go fishing and get skunk, <laughs> but it is day after day. I don't know what the excuses are, but it's about the least amount of fish in the sand that I've ever seen. And I go a lot. I mean, I'm serious. I don't know what's happened. I don't know whether, I don't know whether um, loss of habitat probably the main reason, I guess. That's what usually gets wildlife. Park Service manages for people and the Fish and Wildlife Managers for Critters. I, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> I could tell you this. If you would like to hear my opinion on the Park Service, I think it's one of the best things ever happened to Dare County because it does preserve some stuff. Uh, we all have a place to go swimming or walk on the beach or, or, or hang out that probably wouldn't be if it weren't for the park. And, and in the beginning, there were people who really, really were against it. That Some were tickled to death to sell land that didn't exist, and some were didn't want to sell their land. 
Well, I, I think the Park Service has been good for the Outer Banks, and, uh, and, and we have a lot of things that we can do, like going to the beach and fishing. And um, yeah, if, if it, like I say, if it wasn't for the Park Service, we'd be an entirely different looking environment oh. that I'm not sure that we would be pleased with. No, so, no, it's a big drawing card. No, I'm, I'm not going to say the Park Service does everything right, but they do a lot of good things. Well, I think so. I always did. I, I didn't like the way you control that marsh down there, but that's... Well, I'll let you guys discuss that once we're done. <laughs> now, I think we've drawn uh, close to the end of our time this evening. It's gone quickly. And... Um, I want to thank all of you again for coming tonight and, and for sharing your memories and, and being able uh, to connect with uh, all of us here in the audience and the people who will be seeing this in the, in the future uh, at home. Eddie Green, our living legend of 2008 for the Land of Beginnings Festival, uh, you know, we, we wish you luck with your endeavors in the future. Carl. I would encourage everyone to come visit you at the Frisco American Native Museum. Billy Brown, I haven't finished your book, but I have, have a copy that um, I'm going to enjoy as I, as I read through it. And Bill, the friendship that you and I have struck in the last few years is going to continue to grow, I'm sure. And uh, I'm looking forward to being able to spend that time with you, too. But uh, for those of you in the audience, I, I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight and, um, and supporting our participants and supporting this endeavor. It's important to, to all of us to be able to preserve um, not only the rich history and heritage that we have of this land of beginnings, this land that we love, but it's incumbent on us too uh, to protect and to preserve those things that we hold dear for future generations, and uh, your being here tonight is a, a show of that support. So thanks for coming out, and uh, I hope to see all of you again uh, some other time when we can sit around and tell some more tales. Thank you. Okay.